maybe I will restart. <laughs> How long do you think you spent online today? Um, I guess most of us stay longer than the average person. Um, the internet becomes the vital part of our day-to-day -day lives. On, um, internet, and there are 49 million internet users and they spend six hours and 42 minutes um, on average per day. <sighs> We constantly consume online information and maybe much more than we do physically. And those our minds and behaviors uh, can be strongly influenced by those information that we are exposed to online. And as we spend more and more time online, the impact of online information can be more, uh, can, it can be even more powerful. And unfortunately, not all online contents are beneficial. Some online content can be very harmful. For example, um, online information can alter our mood. Um, the recent study have shown that the use of social media actually can alter our mood among children, adolescents, and even for the older um, others like our parents and grandparents. And it could be even life-threatening. There are many tragic cases where the people committed suicide because of the toxic comment or even get killed due to the misinformation, misinformed treatment of COVID-19. So to, to prevent such tragedies, it would be very important to understand what kind of information we are exposed to. And are those informations are harmful, potentially harmful, like biased, hateful, or misleading, or fake? Or do our opinion and behavior shaped by those information? And who are more resilient or vulnerable to such information? And in answering those questions, we do face some technical challenges. Every day, enormous amount of data is created. For example, there are 2 billion monthly active Facebook users and 6,000 tweets are created per second. So how can we effectively examine this massive online content and its impact? The recent advancement of artificial intelligence has empowered researchers and practitioners to investigate such massive data in a very innovative way. For example, in the area of natural language processing, the emergence of the large scale pre trained models such as WordBag, BERT, or GPT 3 has helped to achieve the state of the art performance in many NLP tasks. Moreover, it enables us to conduct nuanced text analysis as they capture semantic of text extremely well. So in general, I aim to develop AI-based methods and tools to tackle social challenges, including polarization, online hate, misinformation, and mental health. And my recent work has focused on two different things. Uh, one is developing methods to characterize large-scale text, and second, building models to detect harmful content and sources because they can help to understand better about our information exposure and its impact. So in to, uh, today's talk will be in three parts. First, I will introduce a word embedding based method that characterizes large scale text data to capture opinions and a little bit about how we can extend it to detect the framing in the news. Second, I will present my recent work on detecting hateful users using texture data. And lastly, I will share some of my other work in the context of Singapore. So let me start with the first part. So to understand the impact of information exposure to us, we need a reliable way to capture the opinions. Then how can we capture online opinion? Um, given that we are using the texture data, uh, people may use like a sentiment analysis or sense detection. And if we opted for the sentiment analysis, you could use machine learning based methods. So basically you build your own text-based machine learning model to classify, um, uh, to classify a text for each of the sentiments for some of the topics or domains that you'd like to explore. Um, obviously, if you are building your own model, then it would give you much um, better performance. However, building such a model requires um, a manually labeled data, which can be expensive and also quite time consuming. So um, the lexicon-based method have been used, uh, popularly used because they are easy to use. However, um, they could, so the lexicon-based method is basically you have a list of the keywords that are considered to be positive or the negative, and if a text includes those keywords, then you consider the text as like positive or negative. 
And obviously, these are easy to use methods. However, uh, they could work poorly on a particular application because they doesn't consider a context. These lexicon-based methods assumes that the meaning of word does not change. However, um, the however, the context can actually um, alter the meaning of the word. So, for example, the word soft can be used much more negatively in the context of this course, while it can be used very positively in the space of talking about toy animals. So to overcome such a limitation, a study by Hamilton and et al. shows that some propagation method on the vector space embedding can induce the domain-specific uh, sentiment uh, lexicons. So it seems that it's possible to incorporate context on the lexicon-based method as well. Moreover, um, sentiment analysis is kind of limited to capture the opinion because why it may tell whether a text is positive or negative, but it still cannot capture why or what aspects actually are relating to such sentiment. So, then, so can we go beyond the sentiment and develop a way method to examine general word semantics considering their context? And so here we propose the same axis, which is Joe semantic axis. A uh, lightweight uh, framework that characterizes domain specific word semantics based on the word embedding. So, before moving on to this semantics, let me tell you a little bit about word embeddings. So, um, to computationally process the text, which we're going to learn about today, I believe, um, the text needs to be numerically represented on a vector space, right? So, the simplest way that you can do is uh, to create categories for each of the words. And then you mark one for that particular word, and then mark, uh, mark all zeros for the all other word. Um, and this is, and this vector one zero zero for becomes the vector representation for a word cat. And this is called as a one hub encoding and the simplest way that you can represent the word to a numerical vector, right? But then the problem of this method is that it ignores the semantic relationship entirely. So I mean, we know that like. Cat and dog are somewhat more similar compared to cat and turtle. Um, but, but numerically, if you compute the distance between the two words, with this vector, the distance will be exactly the same between those two pairs. So, so finding this good representation of word or sentences have been one of the most challenging tasks in an LP word because the embeddings that keeps a really good semantic relationship can um, help many downstream tasks like classifications or clusterings, etc. So the work led by uh, Ms. Mikolov, Mikolov and others is one of the most significant breakthrough in the vector space representation of language as this very simple neural architecture enabled to train a large amount of data and generate the representation of the word. And since the representation of each word is learned from its context, which is the neighboring word, it, the resulting embedding keeps the semantic relationship of the word extremely well. And these provide the new opportunities to tackle the challenges of the context dependence and the semantic axis to explore this virtue of the word embeddings. So here are the basics of the uh, semantics framework, which is in three steps. So first, Given a corpus, we build a word embedding. Um, and um, we're not going to discuss about how we build a word embedding, but if you're interested in, I'd highly recommend this particular tutorial that will illustrate it word to back. So, given that you have word embedding, so you can assume that all the words are kind of um, can be projected on the vector space, and you can measure which words are more closer to each other and which words are more far away to each other. And because this word embedding is really good method to represent this word, you know that if, if the semantics of the meanings are cool, then they are actually positioned closely in this space. So given that we have this word embedding, um, uh, the second step is we define a particular semantic axis and computing its practice. And the way that we define uh, this axis is that um, uh, we have these two sets of whole words that potentially have the unholiness relationship. So assuming that if we want to define a, set, a sentiment axis, then we uh, create two different sets of words that are negative or the positive words. And then um, we kind of compute the 
uh, once we have these two sets of uh, poor words for the corresponding this uh, axis, uh, then we compute the average vectors of this uh, of this uh, uh, average vector, and we consider it as a, like a center word of this kind of uh, set of words. And then, and so basically, you have one vector for a uh, representing like a positivity, and you have another vector that represents the negativity. And by subtracting this one vector from the other, then we have these semantic axes that are um, meaning that captures the antonymous relationship between these two set of words. And now, once we have this semantic axis, then uh, basically by computing the cosine similarity between this uh, semantic axis and any word vector, then you can map each word on this line of vector. Uh, and then, so the resulting cosine similarity captures like how closely closely the word is aligned to this semantic axis. And the interesting part of this uh, method is that any antonymous word pair can be used to define this semantic axis. So not only like negative to positive, but you can do anything like clean to dirty or respectful to the disrespectful or safe versus dangerous, etc. And uh, to validate our method, we actually use the existing sentiment lexicon. So um, basically, we map all the existing sentiment lexicons on our sentiment axis, and then and then see whether they align well with the actual sentiment labels. And we found that our method, in spite of its simplicity, outperforms some of the existing um, in the other embedding method. And so then now, um, now that to show that how our method can be used in the real application, we applied our method to compare different communities. Um, in particular, we tried to compare two user groups um, um, in, in the Reddit. So comparing this kind of two user group is very common scenarios in, in many social science studies. Um, in fact, I have been facing so many occasions where I have to compare two different uh, groups. So this work was partly inspired by the, uh, the need that I have experienced. And in this work, we use the Reddit data, and I hope that you all know, now know about the Reddit. Reddit is one of the most famous commun online community in the US, and it's even popular in Singapore to a certain extent, and have been widely used for studying different online behaviors as well. So um, we use the Reddit data and we compared the, some of the subreddits, such as Bell Download and the Centers for Presidents. These were the online spaces where the supporters of the Trump and supporters of, of the Sanders were gathering and talk about their uh, these candidates during the US 2016 election. And now as we try to apply uh, our method to the real data, there were some other challenges to deal with. Uh, so for example, if the corporate size is too small, then they were not able to maintain a good uh, semantic relationship. And the Mikolov have constructed this analog test to measure the quality of the word embeddings. And the, word, the original word to back has about 77% accuracy in this test. And when we build the word embedding using the, the donor's data and the center's of residents uh, comments, then the accuracy was only about 60% or the 42%, which is about lower than the word to back. So we to solve that problem, we also it, it meaning that the, the original relationship of the world is not maintained in the world embedding field based on the donor's comments. So because you can imagine that uh, there may be, they may talk about different topics or their language might be different from the common language. So there was some discrepancy between that. So to solve that issue, we opt for the transfer learning, meaning that we firstly build a common embedding that could be more representing the Reddit data in general, and then we Trend, uh, like we, we have this common embedding and then start to update this embedding using our target data. So we randomly sample to 20 million um, Reddit comments from the top 200 subreddits. Uh, and then we build a one embedding and that's it. And when we have this like larger, much larger kind of um, word embedding that trained based on the much larger data, it, it has a uh, better accuracy about uh, 68%. So now, given that we have this common embedding, we kind of updating this embedding using our target data, which is the donor or the center's for uh, president. 
and 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 if you start to kind of update this model based on a smaller corpus, then then the model start to become learns the skewness of the target data. So if there's anything particular within your target data, then your embedding is that become quickly updating and becomes very uh, different from the normal. So we kind of having some threshold to um, that can tell like uh, that still keep keeps the semantic relationship well, but still learning something unique about this target data. So we we set some threshold to decide like when to stop um, when to stop the training. And another limit of uh, uh, challenges that we faced was that because we to define our semantic axis, we had this two set of four words, and we found that our method is quite sensitive to the selection of the same word. And so we compare like three different methods using um, the evaluation of the recreate, recreation of the existing sentiment lexicons and found that this expanded whole word, uh, which basically uses the K closest words, including the two initial whole words, um, performed the most reliably. So we opted for that method. And we are now ready for compare to different communities using these and access. So first, as a as a case study, here we compare the supporters of the Donald Trump and the Bernie Sanders, and and um, uh, here we are looking at the topics of the minority groups. So we selected the terms that are relating to the minority groups, and um, and here the figure actually shows the semantic differences between these two communities, how they perceive these words in each of the community, and we um, I'd like to note that we mapped this. Um, these terms on semantic axis on each word embedding based on each community. So we have two different word embedding that is built based on the two different communities' comments, and each word was um, the, the value was measured on each of the embedding. So here the x axis is the value for uh, the word semantic on the sentiment axis on Donald Trump, and the y axis is actually the difference. So the, if the value is more positive, then that word is perceived more positively among the Trump uh, supporters. If it's a negative, then it is perceived more negatively among the Trump supporters compared to the center supporters. So it's a bit com complicated figures, but hopefully it, um, you can figure it out. So here um, we found that some terms like immigrants and the immigration and the minorities were actually um, perceived more positively among the center, uh, among the Trump supporters compared to the center support. Supporters, while we see some of the like minority groups that are perceived more negatively among the Trump supporters. And I mean, it is kind of reasonable, but it was kind of surprising to see that these terms are actually positively perceived by the Trump supporters because it's like it doesn't make sense, right? So we actually look at the comments that included this word and manually examined, and we found that there were a lot of comments about I support the banning of the immigration. So there were a lot of comments about I support ban of the immigration, and because of that, these words were uh, actually perceived a bit more positively among the Trump supporters than the center supporters. So, uh, but I think so. After the examination, I think the results were somewhat um, understandable. And the interesting part is we can use any antonymous relationship. So here, instead of just looking at the positive and negative, we looked at respect aspect aspect of the respect list. So we build this respect um, sentiment axis, respect axis, and we mapped all these words on this particular axis. And we found that now most of the uh, minority groups are considered to be disrespectful among the Trump supporters than the center supporters. So maybe the positive and negative fix, uh, axis was not able to capture such aspects, but then if we are looking using um, other kind of um, axis, semantic axis, and you can kind of understand better about how these groups are perceived in these particular communities. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's yeah, it's okay. Yes. Exactly. So um, and you're right. So um, 
So once again, the method must be sensitive to this poor word. So I think the selecting of the poor word will be really important. Now we're going to talk a little bit about later. But yes, for the sentiment cases, we start from the amazing and hate two words. And we are not just using the two words, but we actually use closest word of hate and amazing, of hate and amazing. So there could be like amazing and great, fantastic, etc. And then hate and yeah, others. Uh, and then we are um, computing the average factors uh, and then we are subtracting. And for the disrespectful, we are starting with the respectful and the disrespectful, but we also found the case closest to word of that word, and then using the average factor to define the sentiment uh, different words. Another mic, I guess. Yeah, another mic. 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 Yeah
um, how to examine like phrases or the document level levels of semantic changes or we were as we told you we were not able to handling the negations really well um, but we showed that how we can use this um, word embeddings to facilitate more nuanced context dependent analysis uh, which can be used for comparing different communities um, and we believe that it can be extended uh, for many other applications and one of such follow-up work is the frame axis um, based on a very simple definition of that framing is an attempt to highlight a particular aspect from the text. Here, we define the two matrices that capture the framing bias and framing intensity. And now, um, instead of the semantic axis, we call each semantic axis as a microframe. And uh, microframe bias essentially captures how the text is biased, biased on that particular axis. So whether they talk about one side of this particular axis, and the microframe intensity actually captures how intensely this text is talking about um, the, about this, this frame themselves. So if the document actually talks both in like legality or and the illegality, the both side, then basically the text is highlighting more about this aspect. Like so there are two different um, dimensions that we can look into this uh, uh, frame. And here, uh, so we evaluated our method based on uh, the restaurants reviews, and we were able to find that uh, these are like the in intense uh, micro frames. And within the positive reviews, we were able to see that the reviews were about the positive reviews are more about like hospitality, and they are cheerful, they are more cheap, and they are quiet and peaceful. These were these all the um micro frames that are relating to this restaurant review and furthermore we examine the news headlines using the data from the oversight.com and, and these are news about the immigration news and uh, what we can see here is that the, the blue color is the liberals the left leaning news media so they were using um they were it's it's they were using more terms relating to the legal while the right-wing media um, news sources are using more work related to the illegal. But more so the, the x-axis shows the, the bias, but the y-axis shows actually the intensity. So interestingly, the right-wing media actually focusing more on the whether it's illegal or illegal. So, and the left-wing news media tend to less emphasize on that. So they basically avoiding about this particular issue in their news media. So this was kind of like um, analysis possible by using frame axis. Uh, so I will keep it short about frame axis, but if you are curious about it, please refer to our paper. Um, any other questions, Dr. K? Uh, quick question. So how how much more difficult or complex would it be to uh, extend your analysis? So, so previously you look at like individual words, right? And I know that your next step is to look at phrases or perhaps more text. But what if you do simple word combinations, say like two words? Like does that add a ton of complexity to your work? Well, yes. So um... I guess going back to Reddit. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, so the one way that we are actually trying is um, we, I mean, that is very simple and good idea, but it's a silly that we have actually haven't tried it, but we were using more of um, how to use like the sentence embeddings and, and to try it out. So, so the real challenges of this method is, um, is actually its evaluation. Um, so so the technically, I think it may not be so difficult, but the evaluation part will be hard and that's where we are kind of stopped. And, and we're still kind of trying to find a like, better way to do it. So the frame axis was a kind of the part that we kind of tried it out. So now we are kind of measuring the document level, at document level, we are um, gaining the, uh, we are measure, we are be able to measure the uh, micro frames or the mic micro um, in micro frame intensity. So I think really like technically there are different ways that we can explore, but we found that the evaluation is the true difficulties in this kind of, in particular, this kind of like techniques, yeah. Sorry, by evaluation, you mean like in terms of the, uh, I guess. The machine learning process is a kind of evaluation that will be possible. 
So, for example, like we were showing that these words are more disrespectful or the like less respectful, right? And then someone needs to be evaluate whether that word is actually more respectful or disrespectful. So, what does it do? Have a trainer? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, this is called supervised machine learning. And so, uh, you have human coders who look at the one word or two words and to say where does it uh, stand on the spectrum. Right. So that's exactly how we evaluate this analysis because I see that that was the only way that we can properly evaluate. Uh, so like as that you develop this supervised machine learning where you have different categories, uh, basically each word of sentiment lexicon has actually the category whether they are belong to negative or positive or the neutral. And we, but our our method is actually gives you more continuous value, right? It's not in the category, right? So we changed our um, continuous value into these three categories and we measure as that they do in the machine learning. So now we have 732 semantic axes. So to create such labels, that would be really time consuming. And, and also it's very subjective as well. So it was not so easy. So we really explore different ways and evaluate. And, and what we did with the frame axis was the best that we could have done, but, but thanks a lot for yeah. yeah, just a quick final comment. And I could only imagine just, you know, how complex this whole operation has been. Um, the reason I asked my question was because from someone who knows extremely little about this whole thing, and the, the thing that immediately popped to my mind was like, it might be quite important to use some of these words um, in combination with another. So for example, gun on its own, like it's a very neutral, well, maybe not neutral kind of word, but I was thinking like, if you look at gun rights versus gun mm -hmm. control, you would have right. such drastically different uh, evaluation outcomes. Exactly, right? yeah. That's that's really, really great point. And yeah, like if you're interested in exploring that, let me know. <laughs> yeah, you can become a human, like a trainer for the, for the human data set. <laughs> Right, uh, thank you. Um, right, so now I will move on to the second part of my talk. Um, so I will present my research work on detecting hateful users. Uh, so um, COVID uh, on December 31st, 2019, the first known case of COVID-19 was reported in Wuhan, China, and soon COVID has spread around the world. And it has put many lives on hold and has shattered our society. So since then, we have been hearing many heartbreaking news about verbal and physical violence, harassment towards the Asian in many countries. And not just the offline, but online has been also an amplification of the anti-Asian hate, causing plenty of um, hateful comments. So to tackle this online anti-Asian hate during COVID-19, several studies have introduced like new data sets and methods for hate detection towards the Asians. However, um, most studies focus on the content and usual level analysis surprisingly underexplored. And considering the fact that only the handful of users produce hateful content, focusing on users may be an efficient way to tackle online hate. And also it can help us to understand the risk factors of um, hate speech, which can be used as another method. And also, we may be able to develop a better model as the usual level information is richer than the individual tweets or the post. But at the same time, we emphasize that the usual level analysis should be carefully conducted because the prediction of the future offenses or offenses or misbehaviors can potentially lead to the algorithmic bias. So we caution the translation of our results into the practice. And in this work, we aim to study the potential mechanisms and pathways uh, toward the on online hate by building a model that predicts the anti-Asian hateful users. In particular, we focus on the content features such as users' language um, used in their tweets, and also um, we are using the content agnostic features such as what kind of information they are exposed to, and also what's their profiles and the identity on, on Twitter. So in doing so, we construct a data set to conduct a case control study. Uh, we define hateful users as those users who use anti-Asian slower on Twitter multiple times and who live in US. 
And as a reference group, we randomly sampled those users who talked about COVID-19, but haven't used any anti-Asian slow words. And so, so now, uh, so that was about 6,000 users in total. And we collected all their historical tweets for about 11 months um, uh, so before and after the COVID-19. Um, and we further filter out those users who are likely to be bots. And also, uh, we only focus on those users who turn into hateful after the COVID-19. So we exclude all those users who have used the um, anti-Asian slow word before the COVID-19. So here we were uh, extracting some of the representative words of these two user groups. So this is another technique that you can use when you are um, comparing to different user groups. And one of my favorite uh, methods, which is based on the low word analysis, and you can refer the papers or the details of the methodology. Anyhow, these are the words that are representative for each of these user group. And, and the, the, here we only use the tweets that are posted before the COVID-19. So if you are using looking at the hateful users, then you can see that some of words are very political, like US related politics or international politics. Uh, so these are, this paper talks about a lot about the politics. And also we can see some of the words that are hinting that these users are likely to be right wing users because there are words like lefties, socialists, and also some right wing medias like Red Fox News, which is not existing anymore, um, and also like some other uh, gateway pundits. And these are popular right wing news media. And, and if you're looking at the reference users, they are more happy. They are interested in sports and the entertainment. Uh, and many of them are also including some K pop related words, which is one of the most popular content on the Twitter, etc. And now we did the, exactly the same thing for the tweets that are posted after the COVID-19. And the hateful users quickly becomes uh, uh, talking about COVID and especially issues related to the China. And also there are many propagandistic related words as well. So they were blaming governments and blaming um, uh, the, the everyone that's related to the COVID-19. While the reference users were still there, there are they started to pop up some of the COVID-19, but they were not as severely um, 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 exploited compared to the hate users, and they were still happy even after the COVID-19. Uh, to a certain extent, the data is until like May, so it was before the COVID became really serious in, in, in the US. Um, so, and here we also examined what kind of news they are sharing um, on the Twitter. And how we did it is that we now have the URLs, in each of the tweets, and we know the domains, right? And um, the, there's a, this website called the Media Bias Fact Check. And these are the websites where they list many different uh, news domains and they classify them based on their factuality and bias. So the, uh, the bias is also a seven point scale where from extreme left to the extreme right, and the factuality is also from very um, high factual to the questionable sources. So each news domain has the, this kind of bias and the factuality label, and based on that, we were measuring um, what kind of news media they are sharing uh, on, on the Twitter. And in general, we found that the hateful users share much more URLs compared to the reference users. And then, and interestingly, while the represented word analysis hinted that the hateful users are likely to be right, right we, we actually found that they share all different sort of uh, news, um, news articles from different sources. And also they share kind of like uh, news that are highly factual or mostly factual, but at the same time, they were sharing a little bit of a mix of the non factual um, URLs as well. So now um, we are kind of, we are building this model to understand better like what kind of features are actually more um, powerful to predict these users. So for the um, content features, uh, we use the tweet that posted before the COVID-19, and then we extracted like various content features like um, their styles and psycholinguistic features. And also we use this uh, sentence about based on uh, based embedding features of tweets. And here, the sentence bird, which is S bird, is, um, is a kind of variation of the words, but they were retrained to capture better about which sentences are more similar to each other. So if you are measuring the sentence similarity, 
the, the S verse is working much better. So we were using to encode each of the text. So now as we represented each word as a vector, now each, each sentence can be represented as a vector representation. Um, and also we have some shared news media as a content feature. And as a content agnostic feature, we were using some Twitter statistics and their profile description, which was again encoded using this effort. And also we use the, their, their followings. And so basically um, what information sources they are exposed to. Uh, and then we train the XG boost model using these features. So these would be like exactly the supervised model that, um, that we mentioned before. And here we show the results. Um, so uh, surprisingly, the followings, in other words, their information sources alone achieves quite high F1 score. F1 score was 80, indicating that the two groups are likely to be exposed to very different set of information, um, at least on Twitter. And then if we are using the content features, then we found that the experts, so the tweets themselves, have a quite high predictive power and slightly better than the following feature. And overall, like the more they use it, all features actually uh, results in the best performance, which implies that in predicting hateful users, both content and the content agnostic features are uh, complementary. And furthermore, we attempted to uh, predict the level of the hate expression. So we defined the users who posted more than four tweets with Asian slur words uh, as a high level hateful users. And we exactly using the same kind of features. And um, we found that this task is much challenging than just detecting the hate. Um, but similarly, we found that the following user was still showing the better performance among the content agnostic features. But for the content features, um, interestingly, we found that the NIWC, which is more about the psycholinguistic features, were performing slightly better. And across the old, uh, when we were looking at all the features, we found that actually just using the profile and the following um, is performed the best. So the content, what they actually share on Twitter was not really helpful, but their identities and um, their information sources were having more exploratory power for the level of the hate expression. So, so here um, we presented a study on predictive um, hate fluorization during the COVID-19 and uh, provided some how these features are um, contributing to predicting these users. And the results cannot be generalized because we are only look at the US and we may not know whether the same kind of um, results can be found in the other context. Uh, so the most in interesting part was that the, the information sources was having really strong predictive power, power than the, the, the tweets or the content themselves. And we wanted to see whether the same would exist in the other context. So we actually started to look into the case in India. There was a surge of hate towards Muslim during the Tabuli Jama period in COVID-19. So, so we were able to kind of set up a similar kind of experimental design under the context of the Indian. And it seemed that um, hateful users in India showed a very strong nationalism and also they follow PM Modi's. And, but we didn't see that the information sources as the strong predictor there. So it would be that in, in US, the hatredism would be more relating to the political polarization and then may not be the case in India. So, um, but we also see that the network structure uh, may relate to this kind of behavior. So we are currently looking into it and what are the most uh, strong uh, features in, in, under the context of the India. Uh, so I will move to the third part. Um, any questions so far? So from a NLP perspective, and I think many people, participants in the room, they're relatively quite new to this field. Uh, most of them haven't probably done much NLP. And uh, so, would you say that when you change the la language, I mean, apart from obviously the, the how how uh, transportable are the methods from English to say another language, like in general? So, so if it were like Three, four years ago, I would say I have no clue. But recently, um, 
you you see that the Google translation has become like extremely extremely well now, right? So I think this um, understanding like I mean, the translation itself becomes really um, good, meaning that even it there are many that preach. So how should I say? So the the reason that that we were able to build this kind of model is because they have this effort, which is pre-trained the large uh, large pre-trained more than the based on like English. But there are many train many large scale train pre-trained model using other languages as well. And because of the machine translation uh, task in NLP, they have really put a lot of effort to collect the resources for the other languages. And now it exists. So I wouldn't say that it would be a problem. Uh, for now, because like five or 10 years ago to process Korean, it would be extremely difficult because back then we needed like a tokenizations and like lemmatizations and all these kind of like pre-processing to tech actually um, accurately process the text. But now after this era of um, uh, deep learning, such pre-processing becomes less important, meaning that if you just have a large amount of text, then you can build uh, these, these models uh, on that particular language. And once you have that uh, trained model, then the afterwards, the like, downstream task is not so difficult. So, uh, so uh, I know that a lot of these uh, corpuses that we have way too much English corpus and not too much of the other, right? It happens because, for example, Google has done the whole Google. Uh, the, the scanning of all old, the dissertation of all old books and archives and stuff. They're mostly has been focused on English, right? That hasn't quite happened outside in the English language yet. So right, right, yeah, yeah true. But still, there are still. I think any I um, once again, I think any country that becomes having at least through some digitization that are publishing news online or talking online. Um, and like I told you, like there were like 49 million like social media users across the world, right? So I think there are a large amount of text that are generated that are that can be captured from like Facebook or from Google. So they are actually the ones that are really active in creating this kind of uh, large, um, the larger scale pre-trained model of different languages. There are really, embeddings of different languages now. So it may not be as big as English, but I think we have like large amounts of data that can be create a really good um, embeddings for different languages as well. So it is really your choice of whether you want to actually look at your own language or not. So once the embeddings are there, the methods are pretty much- Yeah, pretty straight, much the right? same. Yeah. Yeah. And it's only get better from now. So in that more languages get better and better. And better. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Even more, languages. more languages. Yeah. So I, I will soon talk about that aspect, but I think the problem of studying online behavior in other other country is because they are not posting what we want. They don't share like opinions on social media, then that would be a problem, right? But in terms of the NLP pop, I think there are tons of text in different languages and the NLP people um, have really, really active in creating those embeddings in different languages. Really, like I cannot list all of them, but I will show you later. But really, there are there are there are good embeddings for the other languages as well. But I I wouldn't say that they may not like be able to cover like all the African countries because maybe those countries are having gone through the proper digitization, so their language might be lacking. So there are this particular thought community in NLP that are really focusing on the low resource languages. So how they can create these embeddings using smaller um, uh, text data as well. And I haven't looked into that that much, but I guess in two years, I think they're going to get it out. But actually the key is really having the large amount of the text. And I believe for many of languages, I believe that we already have like large amount of text, it's just, it's just there and we can't handle everything. But those big companies that already have the data, I think they have put a lot of effort to create those resources for other languages as well. Uh, uh, the, uh, final question, uh, and LP stands for Natural Language Processing. 
right? And uh, there are there are some uh, very there's a startup in Nigeria very ambitious to get all the sub-Saharan oh. you know, uh, languages uh, together. And uh, but uh, in addition to uh, different languages, uh, that, uh, to develop the embedded because usually because this morning we started by uh, watching Chris Bell telling us about the beginning of text analysis right from even World War II. Right? And many of the, the embeddings, you know, there the are different contexts. Like uh, I, I really admire you starting with uh, uh, Reddit and uh, uh, Twitter, and much of these are actually informal. But my opinion is about the formality, the degree of formal or informal. Okay, so the traditional we see the accuracy rates. Okay, for training, if you are working with news or textbook, okay, this kind of written language is much easier. The embedding is much less demanding about it. But then for this, uh, uh, the, the oh, informality, yeah. yeah. So can you tell us more about like the, uh, uh, this is something I think in, in uh, uh, you know, other talks will also come out. Like these are more, when we talk about uh, uh, NLP, okay, in different kinds of settings, in the really informal settings where people are using all kinds of puns and jokes, all this, yeah. The, like uh, sarcasm, you know, uh, how can that be handled? Uh, uh, or we have to rely on you know, for for like uh, different uh, subcultures, gamers vis-a-vis -vis, okay, uh, fashion. Okay, community. They may have even very different kind of. Uh, uh, right, yeah, yeah. So the the fabric this was literally was developed for capturing those kind of subtle differences across different. Communities and they are using different arguments, and even for the same word, the, the, the context might be different as well. And that's the reason that I, I believe that's a semantics, and also there are some other related work on using this kind of word embedding to capture lots of subtlety. So, um, I mean, I guess you all will learn more about some more basic kind of text analysis and developing like there are like the steps that you can do, and then the word embedding will be like far oh, later. But once you are reaching there, the, this method I think can do really well. Cap, like you may worry about like sarcasms and this kind of like um, noise that you have in the in the data. But I think the method was developed for if you have a larger kind of corpus, then you can e extract what is the most or fundamental kind of values that you have in that corpus. Um, so, and there could be many other methods that are dealing with it. So, um, the noise and sarcasm can be a big problem if you have a much smaller corpus. But I believe that if you have a large corpus, then what you are extracting, you can be more, the research can be more reliable. And Semixis was designed for kind of understanding this kind of method. And so, one of the challenges that I mentioned was. If you are trying to build your word embedding using the small corpus, then the, the semantic that you are seeing there may not be really good to matching well. And that's the reason that we um, suggested this transfer learning so that you have some big embedding that already kind of stable enough and capturing well of these semantics and you are updating this model just a little bit with your target corpus, then this corpus can reflect like still maintaining a good semantic relationship of word in general words, but you have that they will just update a little bit based on your corpus. And I think that can capture the subtlety of this smaller community. But like, so like, I still have the, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> the, the last part and we have like three minutes, but like, so. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, so like you can ask me like that. I will just quickly go through just I want to be on time, but <laughs> um so um so one thing that I wanted to say like so I, I moved to Singapore two years ago, so it's been almost like two years now, and, and I started to kind of look into some online communities in Singapore as well. And in fact, like there are increasing number of social media users in Singapore, but the, the problem is not problem, but the challenges that I'm seeing is that they are like to discuss in a private channel, but not in a public channel. So the most popular social media is apparently WhatsApp, 
and we see like the telegrams and the Facebook messengers. In the Facebook, I believe that like many of them are in like the, the Facebook groups, not in like the, uh, the, like the private group, not in the public groups. And there are many, many like, private groups. And also the base data in general is very hard to get as well. So in, like, in general, I found it, even though there are many people using the social media in Singapore, it is still very, very hard to capture their opinion because they are not on public. And we are depending on publicly available data. The Reddit and the Twitter that I used in the other previous two studies, they are all publicly available and I can collect them, but these private channels is becomes really, really hard. But the good thing is that there are still sizable amounts of users that are using Twitter and Reddit as well, like 33% and 22%. So I think it's quite sizable. And um, even though the demographics of these um, Reddit or Twitter can be quite skewed, and we need a like really good way to measure who are the people that are talking on these platforms, but still, I think there's some value that you are looking into these, these platforms as well. And at the same time, people are spending a lot of their time on using YouTube and the Facebook as well. So I thought maybe these two kind of platforms would be helpful for understanding like what Singapore people are talk about different issues. So one of my students' projects was about examining the public sentiments on COVID-19 in Singapore. And um, we opted for uh, the data on the Facebook and YouTube. And in particular, one of the observations that I was having is I was following Straight Times and the CNA on the Facebook, and I actually saw that many people actually commenting on these news articles. Uh, surprisingly, many, many comments. So I thought maybe it would be interesting to look at like what people are actually talk on these comment sections on uh, Facebook and the YouTube. So, um, so we focus on the four different media, CNA, the Straight Times, and the Mothership and governments.sg, I mean, they were updating a lot of information of during the COVID-19. And we, we collected all the posts and the YouTube videos and their comments, the first level comments on each of these posts and the YouTube videos. And um, students worked really hard on this. So we used this board topic to do kind of clustering all these articles. And uh, they found like 69 topics and 94 topics from Facebook and YouTube respectively, and then they were manually interpret and correlate them into 54 topics. And then they manually labeled all the posts and the YouTube videos according to these 54 topics. And, and these were the topic distribution. So on Facebook, the most um, largest cluster is here, the updates, the daily updates of the COVID-19. And for YouTube, um, the information and insights on COVID-19 was one of the most uh, prominent topics on the YouTube. So once we have that, we were able to kind of look at, I mean, they look at really different things, but some highlight of uh, so which topics are more engaging. So interestingly, in both of the platforms, um, the news about supporting jobs and supporting grants was actually engaging the most of the users. So meaning that they have most comments, likes, and shares. Um, so these were kind of issues that the people cared the most. And they also looked at um, the comments of these users and what they are actually angry about. So these are the comments that included the anger and they were presenting some representative of the world. And they looked at how it changes like before and after and during the circuit break. So before the circuit break, they were more worried about like uh, food. And during the circuit break, they become little insane, I think. There's a more topic comments and there's a word that are more um, like alarming a little bit of our mental. And the post um, uh, circuit break, they were now worried about like wearing masks and the virus and like issues related to the public transport, etc. And they also wanted to go deeper for each of the topics of what they are talking about. So they were examining the adjectives and the objects of the word. Uh, so these were some of the um, popular kind of uh, set of the adjectives and the objects. And so one of the things that, the reason that I brought up this slide is that on Facebook, we compared to the Facebook on YouTube, we are able to find more comments that are blaming governments. So we saw like the blaming government, create jobs, uh, take care, uh, solve problems, lose jobs. So 
And we found, we think that the, because YouTube is the more anonymous than the Facebook, right? And like we, if we felt that the YouTube was, people felt more free to talk about different issues uh, on YouTube compared to the Facebook. Yes. Oh, um, adjective modifies something, something. Sorry, I, yeah, I need to be careful. Yes. It's purely done by my student, and they, they brought up this method, which I wasn't like super aware of the terms. So I'm sorry, I don't remember. But these are basically to examine the adjectives and then before. So, yeah, I will let you know the exact term. Yes, and I was thinking to add the, add, add the, the meaning or not, but I, I didn't. <laughs> So um, yeah, so that was that. Um, and the second study that I took, sorry, it's already over the time, but that's that I'd like to quickly share is that it's actually the work done in our lab by um, uh, Heung, Heung Ka, Professor Heung Ka. And he looked at the toxicity triggers on Reddit in the context of Singapore. So everyone knows about the online hate and the toxicity trigger is actually very interesting idea. So, you know that sometimes a comment can trigger the toxicity. So even though the, the original comment was not actually toxic, but if that comment leads to have many toxic comments, then we assume that this parents' comments are toxic trigger. So if someone starts to talk about this particular topic, then that may lead to having many toxic comments. So these are the definition of the toxic trigger and have has been looking into this ideas. And the reason many of the studies and toxicity focuses on the Western world that there are hardly and rarely studies in like Asian uh, countries. So he wanted to compare what are the toxic triggers in toxicity triggers in Singapore and he compared with like um, New York, New York. So they use this uh, subreddit, uh, NIC and the Singapore. And even though the Reddit are much smaller community and can be stood, but it's actually quite active, active um, sub communities in Reddit. So he collected the data about like seven months of posts and comments, and basically we built a classification model to predict whether that comment is actually a uh, toxicity trigger or not. Um, and to do so before that, they also had to uh, detect whether a comment is toxic or not, because because every toxic detection model is built based on the Western culture, and now we have a new data, so they actually have to measure whether those models are all working well under the Singapore context. So they did that, and after they build the toxicity detection, they detect the toxicity triggers, and now this is the results that um, uh, top 500 toxicity triggers. So. Um, here, um, one interesting kind of observation is that um, COVID was definitely one of the toxicity trigger, but many education related words appeared in the Singapore community. So like educations and um, some privileges of the particular racial groups were discussed a lot, and that leads to toxic comments um, in, in Singapore. And, and these were more kind of comparisons. So in COVID related news, they had a, like racism and xenophobia related issues and uh, elitism in the local education system and like organizations grew up and um, some, some trivi uh, um, uh, trivial acts and um, some like scams, et cetera. So these were the issues that initially those comments were not toxic, but that lead to many, many toxic comments. So these were the toxicity triggers um, in Singapore. And, and lastly, uh, one thing that we are recently doing is we are trying to um, examine the diversity in, in Singapore in social media posts of the Singapore companies. And here, uh, basically, we are interested in whether a, a company and their social media posts and like those people that they are these are kind of the posts that they are, they think that they are representing their own companies, right? And we wanted to see how generally or the racially diverse in, in these social media posts. And we did a similar study with the US-based companies, and now we are doing similar in the Singapore-based companies. And so 
the way that we do is actually we are using the phase detection and we are infer the gender and the race from the from the phase. And within the Western culture, there's already model existing that can distinguish between like Asian, white, Hispanics, or black, and as a drop. But then the challenge is in our context, we now have like Indian, Malaysians, and Chinese and maybe Korean and Japanese, they are like quite similar and these are haven't been really studied well. So um, we are now trying to using some existing data set that was focusing on the Asian kind of focus on basis and we'll build the base detection model to infer the gender and race. And then we will examine how representative, representative all these companies are. So just wanted to mention that because you can sometimes go beyond the text and there's a Images like the much uh, interesting area and what much, much more hard and challenging as well. Okay, so this is my final slide. So um, I believe that the, the AI and NLP has been really changing the way that we can analyze this large scale and data. And so there are really interesting techniques that I'm like recently exploring, like the semantic law labeling, search classification, or the text generations, uh, etc. So like there are really, it can really um, uh, diversify how you approach your, your data. So like explore more and like, be innovative in a way that how you kind of analyze your data. And like, I believe that the good AI based CSS research is the combination of interesting questions, white data and well formulated tasks and, and lots of endeavors. So um, even though the, I believe that the predicting the hateful user work is actually very very simple task but the paper got accepted in a very good conference because because we were able to uh the, the question was important and also we use we well formulated the, the task so i think that was really helpful for us to uh, uh send it to the really good team and lastly we need more diversity inclusion in css research community and and there are many different kind of limitations why sometimes it is hard to kind of study particular countries but as i show you maybe you can consider like different sources combining different sources uh, to kind of see more holistic view or you can explore more experiment based studies uh, to create your own data and i believe in the later week of the days you will learn more about the experiment based studies and I personally haven't tried, but I always admire such work. So that would be also another way that for you to create your own data to study in other contexts. Right. So thanks a lot for. The speaker battery went off. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry that I'm over like 10 minutes, but no, no, we, no, no problem. Problem. we need to apologize to the people, you know, online, they may not be able to hear us very well now. And uh, so the people online, you can start your lunch break early now. Right? <laughs> but we will still, uh, this is already informal, all right? And uh, so today we will have more lunch break. So we will start lunch is uh, around, uh, maybe we, have, we can still have uh, 15, 20 minutes for Q&A formally, okay, here. And then uh, uh, Jisun will still be with us for lunch, so you can still talk to her okay, during, uh, you know, uh, the lunch hour. And then we will start still start at uh, one p.m., which means okay, actually uh, in summer schools like this, people start to get sick on, on Wednesday, right? <laughs> and last night one one of the people we don't see today actually got sick, so. So you want to go out, okay? If you want to go outside, it's okay to take a 10 minutes walk, just a little stroll. You know, outside the building, you will, you will see how hot Singapore really is, right? And then come back. If you want to do that, okay, individually as a small group, that's also okay. Okay, if you want to stretch yourself, right? And, uh, okay, so it looks like this portable, I think the, oh, that's working now, okay, good. Yeah. Then let's start from the question. Yeah. No, let, then just try to speak up. Yeah. Especially people sitting in the back. Yeah. You know, one way to speak up is to actually stand up. Okay. Yes. And then you will. Yeah.
Okay, so my question is, um, so um, one of my friends has a paper accepted at this year the ICTS2, and uh, his topic is sort of like trying to develop the existing uh, like moral foundation dictionary based on the method. Uh, you talk about like the, the cosine of the factors. So, um, uh, so I, I just wonder, like, like you use that method to sort of analyze the distance between walls and two poles. So, can that? Uh, so, if the existing corpus is well established, can we use this method to uh, extend the existing corpus? So, do you have such experience? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, and like, I think the moral foundation which has a really great like set of lectic principles that maybe that we can present it. So, um, actually, the one paper that uh, inspired us inspired us to work on this analysis was this work by the Hamilton, uh -huh. and they were creating the domain specific sentiment lexicons. So, um, the analysis can may. Being, may be able to reduce the product hypothesis, but it's not for creating like a new set of lexicons. Mm -hmm. um, but like once you are kind of mapping all the words on, on this particular moral dimension, and I think you will require some other method to measure like in this kind of two kind of pull, I mean, kind of like continuous kind of value, maybe you can um, collect some of the words that are in one kind of end and the other one. So, and by measuring like which word actually the most close to these pole words, then you can extend I think these words. So that's one possible way. And this Hamilton, now this is too close to me. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Then the problem is um, how close uh, has it to be so that we can classify it okay. to the Exactly, I think that would be the, like one of the challenges that the, the paper needs to be solved. Yeah. So um, I would suggest like to compare with other methods as well. So there's a MPOF, uh, it's another kind of method that has been exploring using the word embedding to extend the NIWC categories. So, and also even like creating your own kind of category using the word embedding, M MPOF. Uh, it was published in CHI in 2019, I think. And and this Hamilton's work, they were using actually the metric. Um, and they were basically used, so they map all the words of the word embedding and they propagate this label. So uh, it's more of like a metric kind of based method. So and the semantics. <laughs> so I think maybe you can explore these three different methods and, and yeah. see which one would work. But I guess once again. Uh -huh. I think the evaluation is the all, always like very challenging, especially when we're yeah, using the word yeah. embedding. So, creating one good manually labeled extended dictionary and using it to kind of evaluate different methods, I think that would be that would be helpful. Okay. Because these are like unsupervised methods, and they tend to be really hard to kind of evaluate. But that was a thought. Yes, I, I have a few more questions. Okay. So, okay. So, okay. 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 So there's a question in the chat, but, but uh, so uh, so yeah. So uh, so I have a question here. I have a question. Oh. Sorry, no. oh. uh, so so when you were asking, uh, so I've been, this one I've been calling your works as same axis, the great work you're doing there. One question: Where can we find? I think important question: Where can we find some access to use? And are there any online instructions that module? Yeah, you know, um, I I do have a GitHub. That you can calculate the same axis, but um, but the code doesn't include the transfer learning part. So that's the only thing that you may need to look for, like tutorials. But after that, you can use the yeah. Um, I will I will share I will share the GitHub link for the same axis and the frame axis with um with you. Then maybe you can share with yeah. us with us later. Um, it's kind of a practical one in terms of like 
So the work we're doing yesterday, um, we were kind of was really hard to get data from Facebook, but then since the business is going to gain our data from Facebook, we're wondering how right. it works. So um, there are these public groups on Facebook, and for their data, you can collect using Facebook API. So those like private groups or our like own profiles, they cannot, like, almost impossible now, but those public groups, like those news media were all on the public groups and their posts and comments can be collected using the Facebook API. Yes, and um, my students have collected, so I don't know exactly what tool they were using, um, but it's not impossible. So, but, but the limitation is only those public groups. So like there was this very interesting Facebook group like complaints in Singapore. I don't know whether you've seen it. That's really interesting one that I want to kind of analyze it, but it's a private group, so I can't. <laughs> every, every so I just chip in here. So there's this thing called crowd panel. Um, oh, right, right, yeah. So I've used that in my own work. Uh, so crowd panel is basically uh, it used to be a separate company, and then Facebook bought them, and then they kind of basically all public pages, uh, posts, and public groups. So like media outlets and public groups, they provide uh, they provide an archive that you can just download, uh, with, uh, and they give you the aggregated post attributes. For example, number of likes, reactions, shares, the post got the date it was posted, who posted it. But the only limitation is that you need to get an approval through your university. So it's like you need to sign up through, it's kind of like the Twitter API, you sign up through your institutional account. So yeah. Crowd and one word. Yeah, crowd and And if you are academic, it's for free. Yeah, it is for free. I, I don't think it's open to all Every institution is only some institution. No, I think if you sign up with a dot edu or dot ac dot something account, you can get access. To oh, is it? Yeah. I see. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. I thought more of a practical question. So, if I were to summarize, um, I uh, I need to collect some because it's contextual, right? Like the semantic space is supposedly anchored within a certain. Um, either I know you use, for example, subreddit or uh, or or Twitter, and I'm just trying to conceptually understand it. If I were to use it in a very specific context, I should also collect enough like training data for some the process first, and mm -hmm. then use it on uh, an out of sample data set. That, is that how generally it would? Right. So so there's some like. Two ways. So, and like Semexis itself is quite, um, there are some other papers that were exploring kind of using this cosine similarity and this one to this access as well. And um, I saw some of the work they were using actually this, um, the word to back, which is already pre trained kind of the model using like Wikipedia and like um, Google News, et cetera. And, and from there, because it's like so large and it contains a lot of like our language they were able to find more general patterns so um one of the work they had defined is axis of um rich and poor and they mapped or sport and like gold was mapped to the rich and like upper somewhere here um so if you are more interested in general understanding of the human behavior then you can just use this pre-trained model and if you have your own data, like it could be small, then I would recommend using this transfer learning. So you are, because you, it's almost impossible to uh, build a good word embedding if your data is small. So the, the recommended method is using, you, you already have this one um, model that already built based on a large corpus, any corpus, and then you update this model using your data. Then this model is updated based on some context that your corpus has. And then you can kind of examine um, how the words uh, are more related to each other. And you can even add, because your corpus may have some particular jargon that may not appear in this normal kind of corpus, right? So you can update this big model based on your small corpus, then, then you can use that embedding. 
to examine of your particular interest. Thank you. Are there goods like a, a, a you know, project using uh, Malay or Pamia? Interesting. Um, uh, no, actually not, unfortunately. So, so maybe this is something that uh, six Singapore can do, and in the future, you know, can be applied. Yeah. So, yeah. Could, could, could But yeah, if this becomes a tradition, which we hope it does, we'll try to build a more kind of um, unique uh, material that can be used for uh, for studies elsewhere around the world. Uh, so uh, back to the Baptist things. Uh, a really interesting concept. I'm still new to this field, and uh, is um, I don't know whether this is practical or not, but uh, is there a possibility that we have um, like more than dichotomous, like two poles? We have like three or four poles, and like have a, even a quadrant, so that will add a lot of complexity. <laughs> Yes, I believe so. But like, um, okay, this may require some other kind of knowledge. Like, if you have more dimensions, then how you can map them in like multi-dimensional method. But yeah. maybe it is not impossible because like potentially it's just a geography. So I think yeah. it's possible to because each of the world already have the positions, right? Yeah. So it's just a matter of um, you kind of map them. But yeah. if if this I don't know how they would be look, look like if it's yeah, going yeah, yeah. more than like exactly. four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I couldn't think of one as <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if you have more like clear examples, like yeah, yeah, yeah. what exactly. kind of um, applications would be needed for, for those techniques, then then I, I, I can be more imaginative. But yeah. Yeah, for now, I'm not so sure how. There's just some open discussion. Yeah. Uh, and also, like, uh, back to the discussion concerning ungrants, like, um, sort of like gun rights, gun control. Uh, I was also thinking when you talk about gang immigration, it becomes a, a sort of like more positive and oh, like more respectful stuff, like gang uh, immigration. So, um, so maybe, um, like, we can uh, consider. And multiple plans uh, uh, to conduct specific studies so that uh, we can. Uh, I don't know whether uh, you want to focus on the world level or something like that. Um, so, so, in the end, I think like sentence level uh, or the even document level uh -huh. can be helpful because then, then it. I think if the the language becomes so long, then uh -huh. there are multiple kind of semantics yeah, are kind yeah, of in, yeah. in that document. So I think it becomes even harder and harder. And in the end, they may be able to capture the most like the core kind of semantics of the sentence or the document. Uh -huh. um, so I, I think that's the reason that in frame that is the only focus on the title. So the title is rather shorter, right? Yeah. So I guess we even we haven't been able to succeed in in projecting the document level yet, and we don't know like what is the best way yet. Um, so the, the problem is like if we want to kind of consider n grants or the longer text, then this we may need to use some the simple word embedding may not be used, they may not be really like uh, useful for that because the gun is here, why is there, and if you just concatenate them. The vector will be tightly in the center, and does that the right representation of the gun right? I don't think so. So mm -hmm. in the end, we will need uh, some other deep learning neural networks that are trained actually for like one gram and n gram, or even like a larger longer type of sentences. So 
basically like the first is to contextualize um like language representation model and we could be able to kind of exploit that to help to solve this engram problem but but that's also not so easy and we are still kind of working on that okay thank you so much yeah okay i think we have one last question before we go for lunch Oh, nice to see you. So, uh, for the third part, so uh, the, they uh, they manually labeled all the data sets. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so, well, so it's a uh, yeah. That's that was the interesting of my student part of this thing. So we have a 40, uh, 54 topics, and the post and the so they only labeled the post and the YouTube videos, which was about twenty thousand in total, and so. I recommend them to use the um, just talking modeling to actually uh, there's all like methods that are matching yes. the, each of the article to the topic. Okay. And then but then they, they realized that the, they wasn't sure about the quality of that. Yeah. So, okay. so they, yeah. and also for the uh, the verb, the noun and adjective, so they also labeled uh, themselves. No, 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 that that's that's just uh, that's all um I think they were using spacey. Yeah, I mean, oh, the, I mean, the post tagging, right? The post tagging is not so difficult. Uh, so yeah. They were using some type of library. Okay. And uh, another uh, small question. So it, it might be sound a little stupid. So uh, I, there are 7 billion people in the world. So uh, why there will be uh, 40, 40 billion uh, like users, internet users? So I guess like there tagging. could be maybe multiple accounts. Uh, and also like organizations and news media, maybe they are all considered that an individual uh, account. So yeah, I actually haven't haven't checked about that part yet, but that's a, yeah. that's a good comment. Yeah. Okay. Let me check what I got wrong. wrong. Uh, and how can no one ever mention the body? I, I presented this one. I assume it was million. Yeah, maybe I yeah, maybe it was million that I think the two billion Facebook users in the in each of the thing I was facing is not in my memory. Sorry, uh, that's probably but there my are mistake, already yeah. two billion. But there are already two billion Twitter users. So I assume uh is that number is a uh, sum of all the social platforms, not 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 in one. But 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 if that's so, uh, how does it uh, come to the average of six hours uh, per, per day or per week? Uh, per day. Per day. So. Yeah. But that they are using the internet, not just social media. Uh, internet. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that, uh, you, are, <laughs> you are using more than six hours of internet. Right? Uh, yeah. But, but, but like, the including the Google links. Yeah, but the question is why the, oh, the so, so many, so many, yeah, so many uh, users. Yeah. I mean, but, like, like you're using your phone is also part of using internet. Like, yeah. I yeah. think everyone's are like, Basically, they are active. Oh, okay. Yeah. But anyhow, I think this can this can go later for the discussion. But thanks a lot for pointing out. I will check the numbers again. I updated this only this year, but yeah, thank you. Adjective modifier. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Jisun, and uh, for this talk. I'm sure everyone uh, enjoyed this and learned a lot of new stuff. Uh, uh, those who are on, I'm sorry, you cannot join us for lunch, but you're welcome if you can make it here uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, but otherwise, we are breaking for lunch and we will come back to give you some extra time today because that can like, stretch your legs a bit, go out maybe. So we'll uh, reconvene at one o'clock in this room, right? So you have one and a half hours. And uh, Jusun will be joining us for lunch. So feel free to talk to her if you uh, just tell you want to talk about anything related to our talk or anything other. Else too. Um, I'm sure she'll be happy to uh, answer your questions. All right, so see you all at one o'clock. Uh, I'm going to close the Zoom now.